Hello, I'm Jonathan Van Bilsen, and welcome to this special show focusing on dog guides. We're going to be speaking with several people who either own dog guides or live with people who do. The mission of the Lions Foundation of Canada Dog Guides is to empower Canadians with disabilities to navigate their world with confidence and independence by providing dog guides at no cost to them and supporting each pair in their journey together. From guiding their owners through their daily lives to getting help when it's needed most, dog guides play a crucial role in the lives of Canadians with disabilities. Our first guest today is Linda De Silva. Linda, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm great, thank you. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. So you've been involved with, with dog guides for quite a while. I understand you're on your second dog now. And I am. His name is Quasar, which is an interesting right. name. Quite an interesting name. Did he come with that name? He came with that name. And my daughter Googled it, and it means the brightest star in the universe. Really? That's interesting. I bet he is. I bet he is. He is. So you're, you yourself have MS, if I'm not mistaken. And I do. And that's why you have Quasar, right? As a yes. dog guide. So tell me a little bit about the process. How long have you had dog guides and how did you get involved with them to begin with? Um, actually, another lady with MS um, introduced me. She had a dog and she introduced them to me. Okay. And um, I applied for one. Uh, it took me... Approximately two years, I waited to get my first dog. Wow. Um, it was probably the best thing I ever did because he gave me some independence, um, made it so I can go out and feel comfortable going out. Uh, so so the, dog had, is, the dog came to you fully trained? Uh, they, the dogs go through approximately 18 months of training. Wow. They start when they're seven seven or eight weeks old okay and uh yeah and then they're about 18 months old when you get them wow. yeah the, the training they go through is amazing what uh, what type of dog is quasar a yellow lab okay. actually both of my dogs have been purebred yellow labs okay um and how long did you have the previous dog he um he got cancer i had him I think he was approximately 14 when we had to put him down. Okay. Um, and how long now, did you have to wait for the second dog? Maybe five months. Okay. When you, when you have a previous dog, you do go to the top of the list. I see. For a dog. Okay. Um, that's okay. their policy. So how, how has Quasar or, or the, guide, the dog guide in general, how has that changed your, your life? You said you're able to get outside more and things like that. Uh, I presume before that you couldn't? Well, it's not that I couldn't. It's just, well, it's before I wouldn't. Um, I didn't feel secure going out with that, um, having somebody with me. He helps Once you. I got hero, I started, I started doing a lot more advocacy and volunteer work right. just made me feel better about me. Um, what type of thing do you do? Well, I've had people, I had one lady who uh, had an issue that uh, she was removed from a restaurant because she had a puppy in training. Really? And, uh, yes. And uh, she, uh, she worked for the Ontario government, so she couldn't really, didn't feel she could take it on herself because of her job. Right. So she came to me and uh, I went to the restaurant and I approached them. Okay. And I, I have a rather large mouth when it comes to <laughs> dealing with these things. Right. And I told the, the head office that uh, I gave them two choices that either they could cut dog guides a rather large check or that I was going to go to human, the human rights tribunal right. very publicly. And um, let me guess, let me guess. They made a donation. Absolutely. <laughs> and I said, I wanted to know when the check was cut. Well, Linda, and, very, very much appreciate your time today sharing your experiences you. with us. I think it'll be uh, it'll give people a lot of insight as to exactly what what's involved 
in both the, the program of guide dogs and, and the actual person who has one. So thank you very, very much for your time. And Have a great day. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And hopefully we'll see you in the, uh, somewhere on the streets with a dog in the upcoming months. Absolutely. Thank you, you so have much. A great Take day. care. Our next guest is Karen Patrickwin. And Karen is the mom of Liam, who is 15 years old, who has a dog guide named Joey. Karen, welcome to the show. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about Liam. As I mentioned, he's 15. Uh, how long have you had Joey now as a dog guide? We've had Joey, we will have had Joey in May for two years. Obviously now, can I ask what Liam's issue is, why he has a dog guide? Yes, of course. So Liam has autism and uh, Joey is an autism assistance dog guide from the Lions Foundation of Canada. Okay, and what type of dog is Joey? Joey is a golden retriever lab cross. Okay. So, so what was, uh, what was life like before you got Joey? So before we got Joey, um, you know, going out in public was really difficult with Liam. Um, him attending school was difficult. He has uh, sensory processing issues. Um, he is a visual, you know, he sees everything in pictures. Anything that's really loud or overcrowding or overstimulating, um, can create quite a bit of anxiety for him. And uh, so when we would go out in public, if things were overstimulating or upsetting, um, it could create a lot of anxiety and could result in, in many things. And without Joey being there as a, um, you know, sometimes we would use something like a weighted vest or something to sort of contain Liam to um, calm him. It's very calming for him. Um, without Joey being with him all the time, going out in public would be difficult. He also didn't have a lot of uh, independence and socialization was difficult, particularly with people who didn't recognize that he had autism and they were expecting your average at the time 13 or less year old. Um, so that's kind of what life was like, right. so, you know, sometimes meltdown, sometimes awkwardness in public, difficulties focusing in school, lack of independence. And I'm sure with, with autism, it's not something, it's, it's not an illness that is, is immediately uh, visible. No, by it's a lot not. And Liam, Liam, when you look at him, he looks like your average 15 right. year old until he starts speaking with you because he has a bit of a speech delay or um, you know, you see an unusual behavior for a 15 year old, that's when people recognize. So what exactly is Joey uh, provided for Liam? Joey ha has a command that um, is called hugs. And if Liam is sitting down, he can actually come up on Liam's lap and sort of provide that weight um, that replaces something like a weighted vest or some containment that is a calming mechanism for, yeah. for Liam. Um, and because Joey is with him all the time, it, you know, he can ask him to do that at any point in time in his day when he requires it. I understand that uh, Joey goes to school with Liam sometimes. He absolutely goes to school with Joey every day. He goes on the bus with him um, and he is basically there for him all day at school. Um, you know, Liam is Joey's handler, um, so he's able to take him out to go for a walk with him during the school break uh, at lunchtime and make sure he, you know, uh, is taken care of. So he also has a responsibility that he never had before. And sometimes when you have a kid for special needs, you're often doing things for them. And it's good that he has um, right. Joey to take care of himself. It's, it's part of his independence and maturity as well. We'll, uh, we'll look forward to Joey getting his uh, secondary school diploma as well then. I know. Well, I do have a picture, a grad picture of Liam from grade eight and Joey is in it. So that's pretty amazing. Oh, wonderful. Karen, listen, thank you very, very much for joining us today. It's been very, very insightful and, and educational. And I keep learning every time I talk to people and commend people for, for what they can accomplish. And I'm also glad that there are organizations such as the Lions Club out there that provide these sort of services. So thank you very much for your time. 
Look forward to seeing you out in the streets with the dogs. Our next guest today is Jillian McShane, and Jillian takes it from a different perspective, the fostering end of puppies. Mm. Jillian, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. So I understand that you look after fostering guide dogs. Which I do. Very commendable and very, very difficult, I would think, getting attached to a puppy and then having to give them up. You know, it is hard to give them up, but... Uh, when you go into fostering, you go in because you really want to give back to another Canadian in need. And so I always say to people, I can go out and get a pet dog, but a Canadian in need cannot just go and get a service dog or a dog guide. So this is my contribution to another Canadian. It makes for a beautiful way to get involved in volunteering. And how, how did you get into, uh, into the program? Well, my husband and I were down at the Sportsman Show many years ago, actually back in 1984, and Lions Foundation had a booth, and we were drawn to it because there were some dogs in the booth, and we learned about the uh, fostering program, and shortly thereafter, we had our first Golden Retriever puppy to raise, and it's been a joy since that time. It's been a long time. So I, I, I have a dog as well. Um, <laughs> what, what's involved in actually training a dog for, for dog guiding. Right. Well, for the foster, um, the most responsible thing we can do is make sure that we have a dog that gets along well in public. So what we do is all the socialization. We take them to many uh, venues. We take them on public transit, to malls, to grocery stores. So they know how to behave in public. That's our big job. Um, the training for the skills is actually left to the trainers when they go to Dog Guide University. I so see. we want to make sure that when we send a dog off to Dog Guide University, we're sending the best candidate off so that they can begin their skills training from there. Okay. And where is the university? Where is that done? Uh, dog Guide University is right in downtown Oakville. It's been there for a very long time. It's a beautiful facility. It's the oldest dog guide school in Canada. And um, it services dogs all over Canada from coast to coast to coast. Wow. I, I know it's a, it's a very, very um, incredible service that's provided mm -hmm. because there is no charge to the recipients of the, of the dogs. Um, yeah. I mean, a lot of people don't know that. Um, it usually costs anywhere from about $25,000 to $30,000 to raise a pup right. from the time their pups right through to the time they graduate. And that is all done through grassroots fundraising, the walk for dog guides, uh, various charity events, and the donations from the public. There's no government funding at all. Right. So it's all done to provide another Canadian with a dog guide. It's amazing. I, it's, it's quite a program. I participated in one of the dog guide walks, and uh, it was quite enjoyable. And it, it's, it's lots of fun. <laughs> and and plus, it's great that people pitch in. You know, everybody's yes. So you've got uh, you've got Freddie, who's been with you now for a couple of years. I'm assuming that during mm -hmm. COVID times, the socializing element is a little bit different, to say the least. It, yeah, it's really tricky. I mean, COVID has really hampered. Uh, I mean, all our lives, but specifically for the pups. So normally, you would keep the dog for how long? We normally get the pups when they're about seven to eight weeks, okay. and we normally keep them until they're roughly about 12 to 14 months old. Okay. Uh, currently, that's been extended because of COVID, right. uh, because the school has had to pivot and change its, um, the nature of its work right now. And is Freddie going to go off to university as well? Well, he's not, because he's actually a breeding male. So oh. he gets to lounge around at home until his call comes comes in that his um, services are needed. Right. Uh, he's, he's fathered one litter already of beautiful pups um, mm -hmm. that are all about 10 months old right now. And he should be getting a call very soon for his next breeding date. And then he'll come back and, and live with you again. That's right. He goes off for about two weeks for different assessments um, and to meet his, uh, you know, his mate and right. make sure everything's going well that way. And then he comes back. And in the meantime, I keep up his good manners uh, so that when he does go off to school, he's well behaved and he's a good representation for the school when he's out in public. It's a, it's a fantastic program. I, I, you know, I, I talk to people about it. I'm continually impressed. Listen, thank you very, very much for joining us today. We really do appreciate mm -hmm. your time and everything that you do. 
Thank you so much for your interest and for supporting Dog Guides. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a privilege. Thank you. Our next guest today is Julie Pugh. Julie, welcome to the show. Thank you. So I understand your son, Lucas, who is 10 years old. Yes. Uh, has a guide dog, Lex, and he's had him for That's about two years. Is that right? That is right. Yes. So what exactly is uh, the benefit of Lex to Lucas? Like what, what changes have, have happened in the last two years? It's more of a safety. Uh, it's more peace of mind, I guess, for myself and for his dad. Uh, when we go out with Lex and with Lucas, um, there was a time when if we went out, um, we always had to be holding on to Lex's, uh, sorry, Lucas's hand, not right. Lex's. Right. Um, and we, or we have like a big oversized, it looks like a stroller. Um, but it's, it's classed as a wheelchair. So we would right. have, either have to have him sitting in that with a seatbelt on or be constantly holding onto his hand. Because if you uh, took your eyes off of him for a brief second, he'd be gone. And if there was any crowds, um, it would always, it would be difficult to be able to find him. If you were to call his name, he would not necessarily respond to his name. Right. Um, so with Lex, uh, especially when we go out in public, uh, that's where I really find a big difference. Um, we're able to... Um, give Lucas a little bit of independence. I don't have to always constantly be paying attention to Lucas because honestly, right. Lex kind of is more uh, paying attention to what Luke is doing. And if Luke goes to, you know, wander off, he's tethered to Lex's vest okay. and the slightest pressure and Lex goes into um, like a laying down position uh, mm. without any command. And it, he doesn't allow Lucas to, to go very far. He has the length wow. of, of um, about two feet, two to three feet, he can go. So uh, that's just a peace of mind for us when we go out. Right. Uh, and, and it really gives me a bit of security that uh, Luke's not just going to wander off on me when I'm out in public. Right. I, I can imagine that uh, the, the stress. Now, you had mentioned that um, that Lucas is nonverbal. So, yeah. so how does it work when when Lucas wants Lex to do something or or like, how does the command process work? Um, so the commands do not actually come from Lucas. No. Uh, there's always a handler. So generally it's myself. Um, okay. So if we're out, uh, Lex has uh, a big job really, because not only does he have to pay attention to Lucas, but he also has to listen to my verbal commands. The process, you um, you got Lex from, from Oakville, right? From the Puppy yes. University. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, were, were you, did you spend time there as their? Uh, yes, I did actually. Um, so uh, when I first was told that they had uh, a session for or a dog that was um, suitable for Lucas, um, there was a 10 day session that I went to um, and Lex was always already very well trained. So okay. then they were kind of training me on how Lex was trained. Right. Um, so that I knew the proper commands and the, the expectations of what I should be expecting from uh, the service dog. Okay. What kind of dog is Lex? Uh, he's a lab. Okay. So Lex is, is fairly young then, right? You've had him two years, so he can't be much older than two and a half or so? Uh, Lex is, when we got Lex, he was just over a year old. So he's, okay. he's about three, three and a half years old. Now, do you find when, when you're out and about with, with uh, Lucas and Lex, do you find people coming up and wanting to pet the dog? Does that happen? I think for the most part, people are pretty well aware that when the vest is on, um, I find a lot of people, people will still ask occasionally. Right. Um, but generally, people see that right on the vest, it says, please do not pet. Um, and I haven't really had people just come up and try and touch the dog. Um it does it create a lot of interaction with Luke for Lucas uh, right. because people wanting to come and kind of see the dog, um, they can interact with either myself or with Lucas. Right. So it, it gives us lots of prompts for uh, Lucas to be able to try and say hi to people, right. uh, making eye contact with people. And lastly, the, the change, I guess there's been a big change in Lucas's um, life since Lex entered the picture. Um, do you find it's, it's been a gradual sort of change or was it like a night and day kind of a thing? Like, was um, there, was there any, any hesitancy on Lucas's part to, uh, to have Lex in as part of the family? 
No, I think I think Lucas appreciates having Lex. He okay. he doesn't show affection quite the same as a normal child would. Right. Um, but he certainly uh, like if Lex is near him and he you know pets him, he gets the biggest smile and he'll start giggling. Listen, Julie, thank you so much for spending time with us today and sharing your story. It's been very interesting, very informative, and um, I, I keep learning so much about things uh, you know affiliated with with dog guys. It's, I just find it amazing. All the best to you, Lucas, Lex, and the rest of your family. You take care. Our next guest today is Twane Laher. And she comes to us with her uh, dog guide, uh, York. And I actually met Twane in, uh, about two years ago when we did the, the dog walk in Port Perry, I believe it was. I was emceeing it, and uh, you had the opportunity to do a presentation. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, I'm Twane. I'm 15 years old. Um, I've had York for about three and a half years. And again, I have type one diabetes and he's a diabetic alert dog. So what he does is when my blood sugars go low, he alerts me, he smells that and he warns me so I can eat and treat myself so nothing bad happens. Now, getting York, was that a difficult process or was it relatively simple? Was it a long time? Um, we did wait a while. We waited two years because the process is you register for the guide dog and then someone comes to your house to make sure you're eligible for the dog. And then after that, you get put on a wait list okay. and then um, you wait. So we waited two years and then I went to the Oakville facility right. and I stayed there for about three and a half weeks, just training us and telling us what we need to do and stuff like that. And that was basically the whole process. So you had already met York when you got there and you spent three weeks learning how to train him. Is that? No. So actually, when we get there, the first three days, they won't tell you your dog. You don't know what they look like. You don't know their okay. name. It's very like nerve wracking because everyone wants to know. And they kind of like try to bribe the trainers to tell us. But <laughs> you, don't, you don't know like your dog until like three days after you get there. And what type of dog is uh, is York? A poodle, a standard poodle. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's different. I usually associate, uh, you know, retrievers, labs, or, or goldens with uh, with dog guides. We and... just have them because my dad's allergic to dogs, so they oh. usually give poodles to people who are like allergic to dogs. So, whenever d does York go with you? Whenever you go out. Yes. Okay. He's, he goes everywhere with me. I, I like it. It's nice. Like you have a dog with you everywhere. It's pretty cool. What about school? Same thing. Does he go to school? Yes. Really? He comes to school. So you, I understand you did a presentation to the 100 men in Skugog um, yeah. for funding and you did quite well, I'm told. <laughs> and what was that like? That must have been a little intimidating, right? Having a hundred or so people there and you having to tell your whole story to all these strangers. Yeah, it was. It was kind of like it was just a whole bunch of men. And then we had, I think there was two other people doing speeches to see right. if you get the, I was kind of nervous, but <laughs> yeah, but we ended up winning. So that was good. Right. Congratulations on that. Because from what I understand is it's very, very expensive to, uh, to go through the whole process of getting a guide dog, right? Uh, and, the, and the fact that the Lions Club promotes it and, and funds the entire uh, project is, is remarkable um, because there is no government funding. It's all done by, by people raising money. Do you find people very receptive um, to the whole concept? People ask you questions all the time about, you know, how does this work? What's he do? That sort of thing. Yeah, a lot of people are really curious and they're really surprised that they can actually train a dog to do that. But I think something that people are most surprised is, that it's free of charge. So like the right. Lions Foundation, they don't charge you. It's just free. And that's something that when my parents found out about it, we were really intrigued about that because right. you get it free of charge. But it's actually, I think, around 25000 to train York. I've but heard that, you yes. get it free because of all the donations. As well as the, the time you spent in uh, Oakville is also uh, covered by the their, by their organization, right? Yeah. So, which is which is excellent. I guess when you have a, a situation that that requires York to kind of go into action, have you ever, you know, ha had to have him do more than just nudge you or or anything? 
Yeah, so there's been multiple times where I have a Dexcom 6G. So basically that's connected to my phone and it tells my phone what my blood sugar is. But sometimes that's very slow and it won't pick up on it. So there's been times where York has alerted me and we didn't even know I was low. And then I tested and I was really, really low. Or there's times I'm a really deep sleeper. So sometimes he'll try to wake me up and it doesn't work. So then he goes to my parents' room and he like wakes them and like licks their face until they wake up. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. That is just amazing. It uh, just blows me away that that animals can be trained that way to that degree. you know, prior, prior to learning about the, the dog guides and that I always assumed it was, you know, a dog for blind people and that was it, you know, but the fact that there are service dogs for, for many, many different types of, of situations. And I, I take it, uh, York has fit into the family quite well. Do you have uh, siblings, your brothers and sisters? Yes. I have an older brother. He's 18. Okay. And it all works well. The dog fits in perfectly. Yeah. We're very, animal like we love we love animals so it's good at the beginning though it was kind of hard because they weren't allowed to interact with him because he had to bond with me right and that was hard because all they wanted to do was pet him but now after time it becomes more relaxed right so he does interact a little bit with the rest of the family too i take Mm -hmm. it right but he's still he's still your dog without question right yeah yeah that's uh that's great. Now, how did you, how did your parents become aware of the, the dog guides? Do you know? Uh, social media. I think okay. Facebook, my mom found out that way. Okay. Yeah. I just, I would probably want to mention like how grateful I am for York because he's saved my life multiple times. And it's also, he's not just like a service dog. He's also become my best friend. Right. And I don't think I could ever like, put into words how grateful I am and how he's like saved my life and how much my life has changed before because there were times like when I wouldn't feel safe leaving the house or sometimes my mom wouldn't let me go out because she was scared something was going to happen but now because I have York those aren't even in the picture I feel safe leaving and it's just it's such a blessing to have him oh, that's great well I'm very good that those sort of organizations do exist and that you can take advantage of it and um and that your life has improved dramatically listen thank you very very much for being here today for joining us and sharing your story and that very nice seeing you again hopefully we'll see you walking with the dogs out in the next dog walk the one that's not going to be virtual virtual once this mess all cleans up so thanks very much for being here and we'll talk to you soon bye for now thank you for having me The Lions Foundation does not receive any government funding and relies solely on the support of fundraising efforts like the upcoming Pet Value Walk for Dog Guides, which will be held in Port Perry on May 31st. Contact information is on the screen, and I look forward to participating along with you. For Dog Guides of Canada, I'm Jonathan Van Belsen. Thank you for watching and stay safe.